Good morning and welcome to St Mary's Ely's online service. start with our Bible reading for today, which is from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 9, reading verses 6 to 15, and it's entitled, Generosity Encouraged. Remember this, says Paul, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing God grace that God has given to you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Well, good morning. My name is Piers Coots uh, and I'm a licensed lay minister here at St Mary's in Ely and I'm speaking this morning partly as a licensed lay minister but also partly in my role as church treasurer. I just want to pray for a moment. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable now and always to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, as you've probably guessed already, it's time for the talk on money and giving once again. We do this once a year at St Mary's, so many of you will find this uh, new, but others will find parts of the talk familiar. But hopefully even the old hands will find the sufficient new ideas here to keep your interest. There'll be three parts to my talk this morning. First of all, a brief look at the theory from the Bible. Then some practical guidelines or FAQs, frequently asked questions. And finally, a brief summary of our current financial situation here at St Mary's Ely and Christchurch. In my early days as a Christian, nearly 50 years ago, one of my mentors commented to me, and he wasn't an Anglican, the trouble with the Church of England is they don't teach tithing, giving 10% of your income to God, so they're always short of money. That's a bit of an ouch statement, but it's stayed with me ever since. With that in mind, last year in this talk, I focused on two Bible passages, one from the Old Testament, which described the, pla the place of tithing in Hezekiah's reforms, as reported in 2 Chronicles chapter 31. And another passage from Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus explained that tithing in itself wasn't really that important. The ancient principle of tithing can be one that's useful for us today, but I want to give a couple of warnings as I start. First of all, the, pro the practice of tithing is Old Testament teaching, and it's part of the Old Covenant. And whilst the tithing principle is still useful to us, its force as law does not apply to us as Christians. We are not under the Old Law, but under the New, and that's the Law of Love. And we also need to beware, secondly, of the misleading belief that the more you give to God, the richer you'll become. Whilst it's true that God blesses those who give to him, that doesn't mean that we'll always have lots of money or an easy life. This so-called prosperity gospel is a false teaching which can have some bad implications. For example, do we believe that if people are poor or have lost everything through a war or natural disaster, then it's their own fault? Well, of course we don't. These are precisely the people God wants us to value, respect, and love and show our support for. Well, that was last year's focus, but today, for a change, I'm going to concentrate on St Paul's teaching on giving in his second letter to the Corinthians, and a bit from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's start with St Paul. 
just heard I read to you and I'm going to read a couple of verses again. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 to 8. Remember this, said Paul, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. The context here is of a financial gift being made by one group of Christians to another one. Paul emphasises that such generosity must be spontaneous and unforced, and that it flows from people's experience of God's grace to them. Jesus' teaching on our attitude to money is similarly blunt. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, he says, where moths and vermin destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's from St Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6 verses 19 to 21. As so often, Jesus doesn't get bogged down in detailed rules. He goes straight to the heart, the root of the matter. Where is your heart's true home? Is it in your money, your car, your pension or your property? Well, look at what happens to them when stock markets collapse, banks fail, floods or pandemics or war come. It can all be gone in a moment. So what can we learn from these two passages? Well, firstly, the principle of giving to God has been there right from the start. It was a key part of people's duties under the Old Covenant. Jesus taught about it, and Paul taught about it in the New Testament as well. But as so often, Jesus took the Old Testament principle and widened it out. He freed us from the mechanical keeping of a law, but replaced it with a requirement which actually some people think is tougher. We have to test our own hearts and examine our own motives against the standards of God's generosity. And St Paul in his letter took up that theme, teaching that giving is not about obedience to some rule that we do grudgingly, but it's about how we respond to Jesus' generosity to us. Both these passages really emphasise that getting our hearts right is the important thing. Once that's done, everything else, thoughts, speech, actions, words, work and wallet, if you like, things all beginning with the same letter, these will all follow. Well, that's a very brief look at some of the biblical principles behind giving, how we give in support of other people, how we give in support of those in need, how we give to support God's work through the church. And I want to move on from these now to some practical guidelines on giving, some of those FAQs that I mentioned. The first one, <laughs> the most obvious really, is the key principle in St Paul's words, you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. It's voluntary. It's between you and God, and nobody else is involved. Secondly, it's related to your income. How much anyone has, of course, sorry, how much anyone gives, of course, has to be related to how much they have. How much are they able to pay? You may remember that Jesus praised a widow who had just given a couple of copper coins. As she had so little, that was huge generosity on her part. Now the tricky one. What about the tithe, the 10%? What about that principle of giving 10% of our harvest, our possessions, our income, whatever it is, to God? Well, although it's an Old Testament concept, there's nothing wrong with it as a starting point. I'm really glad that Katie and I were taught that right at the beginning when we were new Christians. 
it meant that as we set up home together, our budget, including our mortgage, was based on 90% of our income, so that our giving wasn't too much of a strain. However, if someone comes to faith, having already got a big mortgage and a family budget that only just works as it is, then giving 10% would be much harder. Indeed, it might be impossible, at least at first. You have to work these things out for yourself. Next, should our giving go to church or to other charities or to both? Well, it's up to you. Some people say one, some another. Katie and I split ours, but with the majority of our giving going to church. Another question. What if your partner doesn't share your faith? Now, Katie and I are fortunate in that we're both Christians. What if your partner isn't? Should you try and insist on giving a substantial amount, even if they don't want to? My advice would be, not if you want your relationship to last. As with all relationship stuff, finances must be worked out together, not unilaterally. unilaterally. It's better to talk about these things, even if it feels difficult at first. Now, what about if you're really short of money? If you couldn't possibly afford to give 10%, will you be condemned by God because of that? Well, what do you think? Of course not. This giving is up to you to work out together with your loving Heavenly Father. And this year in particular, I want to focus on this point. Now, I'm recording this on Wednesday, and the government, the new government, um, under our new Prime Minister, has announced that they're going to have some new measures launched on Thursday. That's tomorrow to me now. But whatever they announce, it's clear. This winter is going to be really tough for millions and millions of people. Inflation affects everyone, of course, but the current huge hike in energy prices is going to hit some people harder than others. As with so many of life's problems, unfortunately, this crisis is likely to have the greatest impact on those in our society who have the least ability to cope with it. So I want to be very clear here. As church treasurer, of course, I want to encourage everyone to give, to give to the church and to give very generously. But Jesus' mission was emphatically not to put more burdens on those who were already struggling. He was very harsh in his criticism of the scribes and the Pharisees for doing precisely that. Jesus' mission, and ours, is to set people free. So, if this winter you're faced with a choice between keeping warm and giving to church, then keep warm. If you have to choose between feeding your family and giving to the church, then obviously buy some food. If the energy crisis is putting you in an impossible position, then please feel free to reduce or stop your church giving until the financial situation eases. So how could this work? If 10 or 20% of our givers have to reduce or take a pause in their giving, how will the church be able to pay its bills? Particularly as, as I'll explain in a moment, those bills are going to rise next year. When I first wrote this down, I actually wrote, how on earth will the church pay its bills? And then I realised that phrase gave the answer straight away. Our resources come from heaven, not from earth. And our Heavenly Father has always provided what we need, and he will continue to do so. So how will God provide these resources? Well, that segues nicely into my next point. If those of us who are under pressure may have to cut back, it will be up to the rest of us, whose finances have more leeway, to take up the slack. The tithing concept was never meant to be more than a starting point, a guideline for beginners, and it's certainly not an upper limit. And if you're better off, if you've been blessed financially, well, that's great. Enjoy that blessing and enjoy being more generous as well. As St Paul said to those whom God had blessed with relative riches, it's so that you can be generous on every occasion. 
and your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I've produced a summary of these FAQs um, on a sheet. Um, in church we're going to be handing them out and I'll see if we can get a copy of that put on the website next to the link to this talk. However, if we actually try and pin down everything to simple rules, well, we're probably not asking the right questions. What it comes down to is this. God is generous to us and he wants us to be generous in our turn because he wants us to become like him. It's up to each of us to decide within our own families and to do it between us and God. So that's the theory and the practical guidelines part of today's talk. And I want to finish just with some facts and figures from my position as church treasurer. The first thing to say is thank you. Thanks to all of you, our donors. It takes around £200,000 a year for our everyday budget at St Mary's and Christchurch, and without your regular financial support, we couldn't function. Please don't any of you, and I have heard people say this to me, please don't ever think your gift isn't much. That's not true. Everything we give, whether it's time or caring or money or whatever, everything we give is valuable and is appreciated. And to encourage you, I can report the good news that as of the end of August, we seem to be on track as a church to meet our budget for 2022. Next, what about that big event for us at the moment, our building project, what we call the BTP? Well, much of the work, I can tell you, has now been done, and we're hoping to gain access to the building in late October and to be reopening towards the end of November or beginning of December. Now, let's be honest here, problems have emerged during the year and the costs have risen, but we now have sufficient funds to pay for the main part of the project. Isn't that great? So how's this money been raised? Well, I've made just a brief summary of this on the sheet and I'll just read it to you now. We've had £298,000 of historic funds. We've had £381,000 given by church members. We made £7,000 by selling the church pews and floorboards and bits and pieces. We've received £467,000 in grants from trust giving, uh, grant giving trusts and from the local district council. And we've received £29,000 from interest and the church's reserves. And that's made a total of £1,182,000. This is really remarkable. We are so grateful to so many people and bodies for this support. Do we still need donations? Well, not actually for that main project, but I still say, yes, please, we do, because we're now we're starting to raise project funds for the next parts of our building transformation project. And those parts will be the refit and expansion of our church toilets, and I'm sure we'll all agree they're well overdue for that. And we're hoping to investigate whether we can install some solar panels to reduce our electricity bills particularly important now that the cost of electricity has gone up so much. So if you would like to make a donation, we'll be very happy to help hear from you, of course, what Treasurer would say otherwise. But mainly what I want to say is thank you. Thank you to all of you for your tremendous support of the project so far. Next, I want to say a little bit about the mission and charity causes we're supporting. We aim as a church to give 10% of our unrestricted general income and that this year will be about £20,000 of, of giving, to causes other than ourselves. About half of this amount of giving, about £10,000, is committed from our regular budget. It comes from your general donations. I pay it each month to our chosen causes by standing order. And the other half, the other 50%, the other £10,000 of this money we give away, comes, we hope, from donations made by people to the causes we're supporting, and from our various fundraising events. Our charity fundraising target for 2022 is just over £10,000. In this spring, we actually added an additional charity to our list, which was the Disasters Emergency Committee Ukraine Appeal. 
and over £5,000 been given for that one alone so far. And together with that, we have actually already passed our annual target for giving to charities. By the 31st of August, a total of £12,400 had been contributed in fundraising. This is extraordinary, so thank you again for that. What about looking forward to next year, to 2023? Well, September is the month when church treasurers start looking forward to the budget for the next year. Uh, I've just had a look through ours. There are a number of factors that will increase the amount we're going to need next year. The biggest amount in our spending is what's called ministry share, which is the payment we make to the diocese to cover the cost of clergy salaries, houses, training and pensions. We don't know for sure yet how much that will increase this year, but with inflation running at 10%, it's obvious the diocese will have to raise our, the request to us for ministry share very substantially for 2023. The second area we're looking at is we're currently only paying for a quarter of the costs of our second full-time minister. And we have agreed as a church to increase this proportion year by year as our finances allow. And so we're hoping to increase the amount that we contribute to the central church on that basis. Then comes the obvious increase, energy bills. I've had a look at our energy price uh, costs and we've just renewed our contracts for another year. And I estimate that our electricity and our gas bills in total this year, next year, will be about £7,000 higher than this year. That is, they will have about tripled. And of course, our own staff and our other costs will also have increasing costs. Together, I think this will lead to probably to a net addition to costs in our everyday budget of somewhere around £15,000 for the year. Your generous support will be as important as ever in 2023. Now a few words on practicality here. How should you give? Well, I have to say our preferred method is the parish giving scheme, what we call PGS. Um, it's a planned giving system and it's absolutely great. You can sign up to it online or complete a simple paper form which we can give you and parish giving scheme do everything else. 95%, 95 people, sorry, are using Parish Giving Scheme already at St Mary's and Christchurch, and thank you for that. Uh, if you haven't started regular giving yet, or if you're giving in some other way and would like to switch to Parish Giving Scheme, please do consider doing so. As a treasurer, it's a wonderful scheme. It saves so much work. All the giving comes in one payment straight away at the beginning of the month into our bank account. Being a regular giver is part of saying we belong to the church family, along with giving our time and skills and love and everything else. And as a treasurer, I would not be doing my job if I didn't have a quick word here about wills and planning legacies. Including a donation to the church in your will can make an enormous difference, especially to projects like our current Building Transformation project. I'll give you an example. So far this year, we've received two legacies, uh, which have helped our next campaign, the Building Transformation uh, Project Toilets Appeal, to reach £11,000 already. And depending on your circumstances, there can sometimes be tax advantages in including charity donations in your will as well. You should get financial advice on that. So please don't put off writing or updating your will. And if you also do desire to give to a gift to St Mary's in your will, either a set amount or a percentage of your estate, well, that would, of course, be great. Well, that's a lot to think about. You have a handout to take away or to download from the, the internet. So can I ask you to read the handout and pray about these matters? Please review your giving in the light of the financial challenges in our 2023 budget. Please sign up for Parish Giving Scheme if you haven't done so already. Please consider a donation, either a fixed sum or a percentage, to the church if you're making or updating your will. However, more important than all those things, you must give what you have decided, not reluctantly or under compulsion. And that was St Paul who could be quite bossy at times. Or as Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So thank you very much indeed. Let's pray together. 
Lord God, for each of us, you know our circumstances and our financial situation, and your advice and guidance will always be specific to us personally. Help us then to hear your Holy Spirit's prompting clearly on the subject of our giving. If our situation is tough and we can't afford to heat our home or feed our family, you may well be telling us to reduce or stop our giving for the next few months. If we're comfortably off, you may ask us to give up some more for a while to make up for those who've had to cut back. Whatever you ask us to do, help us to feel free to obey your word to us without any fear or pressure or false, false compulsion. For your nature is generous and you long for us to learn to be the same. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And finally, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And